All right, let's go ahead and kick this thing off. Uh, welcome. My name is Ryan Lowe. Uh, I am a um, essay evangelist on the Amazon Alexa team, and I have been live streaming the development of a new Alexa skill that I'm working on. Um, so my job is to uh, educate and inspire developers to build with Alexa, and so one of the best ways for me to do that is to build myself skills and um, I get to broadcast them and you get to watch me fumble around and struggle to figure out what errors and typos I have in my code. I'm not the best developer, but uh, hopefully you have fun. So uh, the skill I am working on is actually one that is hopefully going to be useful and, and comes out of one of my own use cases, which is uh, every Tuesday, uh, my co-host and I, Jeff Blankenberg, uh, we uh, host office hours for Alexa developers. Uh, we host it on Twitch and a bunch of other, uh, we stream it to YouTube and LinkedIn and a bunch of other locations. But at the end of every one of those office hours, we archive that video into YouTube. One of the things that we uh, were realizing is that we have hours and hours and hours of Q&A between us and the developer community where we are answering questions. And if you tuned in live, then great, you got to uh, see those uh, answers, uh, and you get to ask your own answers, and we or ask your own questions, and we try to answer them. Um, but if you are looking for a particular answer, it's nearly impossible. You're not going to be able to um, find it. You could go to YouTube and just watch hours and hours and hours of video archives, uh, but no one's going to do that for one particular question. So. What we thought would be great to have a searchable index of old office hours. And so that's exactly what I'm building. Um, I'm building a searchable index, so uh, I can actually show the architecture diagram. Um, this is in progress. All of this is in progress. None of this is mapped out 100% in my head. It's um, vaguely stitched together, um, and I have some idea where we're going, uh, but let's find out where this you know, entirely leads us. Um, so the idea being uh, when an office hour session is over, uh, the archive video gets stored into YouTube. What we wanna do is we wanna pull that down and um, the end result is index it. And so then we can access it via an Alexa skill. And the user experience I want down here is going to be users can then ask their Alexa device to say, show me from office hours, um, and then, you know, name a topic, like show me from office hours uh, when they were talking about APL, Alexa presentation language. And the skill would go and search in the database and pull back um, and start playing either the audio only for uh, devices without a screen or if you have an Echo Show device, like some of mine over here, um, then it would actually start streaming the video at that moment in time when we're talking about it. So hopefully being able to answer the question. Um, that's the end goal. And so in order to get there, uh, we need a bunch of infrastructure in place. I'm starting with all the backend services. So I haven't started on the Alexa side of the house that will be coming. Um, in my mind, it makes sense to build out the database first to make sure we have the ability to index all these videos and, and store them. And so um, this is uh, the beginning of an architecture diagram. Um, it's not a complete architecture diagram. Um, and the way I draw architecture diagrams is to kind of communicate a story. And so that's what this is. So again, we're going to pull down these videos um, into Amazon S3, which is uh, data storage, um, block storage, where you can store large files like um, videos. You can do a lot more with S3, but that's what we're going to be using it for here. And that's going to kick off an orchestration. Um, and it, what's, what we're going to do is we first need to convert the video into a format that we can process. Uh, and then we're going to run it through a couple different Amazon Web Service uh, services. So uh, first one being Media Convert to actually convert the format over because YouTube doesn't give us the file format in the, in the format we need. Um, and then we're going to run it through Amazon Transcribe, which is going to pull out all the raw text from the video. Um, and then we're going to run it through Amazon Comprehend, which is going to create structure from all that raw text. And then we're going to store that in Amazon Elasticsearch. We're going to orchestrate all this um, using AWS Lambda and step functions to call the different lambdas and kind of orchestrate this entire experience. That is where I have started. So I am working with um, a GitHub repo that uh, any, anyone can follow along. Um, I need to add a better readme here. But 
Um, this is the GitHub repo that I am live coding. I will commit this at the end of every session here. Um, and so people will have access to everything that I'm working on. Um, so I did start with the uh, step functions. Um, so what I have, I skipped over the media convert right now. So right now I'm, I'm testing this all with a, uh, with a YouTube video that I have previously converted over to the proper format. And we'll come back to that. So I started with Amazon Transcribe, um, and last session I just added Amazon Comprehend. Um, and if we look at the step function that was created, and I kicked this off last time right before I ended the stream, um, you can see here that uh, this is what the current state of the step function looks like. So if you're not familiar with step functions, um, they allow you to kind of orchestrate the, a bunch of different processes. So some of these are Lambda functions, um, and some of these are just steps um, to manage state transition inside a state inside a step function inside the state machine state machine inside the service step functions. Um, so what this uh, state machine is doing is the very first step is it's saying start the transcription process, and because transcribing can take uh, I think here it takes like up to twenty minutes with um, a YouTube video. Maybe last time it only took like ten minutes. It's a long running process. We don't want Lambda running for 10 minutes, waiting on this to end. So the way we are orchestrating this is we have one Lambda function that just all it does is start the trans transaction process. Then we're going to wait, and we have another Lambda function that is just checks on the status um, of that process. So the way this works is uh, we start the trans transcribe process. We then wait. I think it's waiting like 30 seconds, and then it checks on the status. If it's finished, it moves on. If not, it goes back to the wait state. And if it errors out, then we, we fail with a, with a very specific state. So uh, last time I had written this comprehend paragraph um, lambda function, I put it inside of a parallel path. So we are going to split this out. Um, and I'll showcase that in a second. Um, I kicked this off, and it failed. Um, I should also add, before I jump, jump into this, I am following... Um, a blog post that was written a few years ago where they're doing something very, very similar with podcasts. So they're downloading podcast audio, running through Transcribe and indexing um, podcasts, which is really, really cool. But I'm kind of uh, stealing from all that. Um, and I'm using uh, CloudFormation uh, to build up this infrastructure, and then I can now take this infrastructure, which is written in YAML. I can show that. Let me uh, actually clear everything over here. Um, this is my uh, GitHub repo, uh, and if we look at the um, CloudFormation template, um, which I'm actually using Service Application Model Framework, which sits on top of CloudFormation, um, so there's a transform that happens here, but this is pretty much CloudFormation template. I can now save and persist my infrastructure as code with version control and GitHub and, and everything else. Um, so this is how I'm describing all of this. So I will define my infrastructure here and then deploy it up into AWS. And that's exactly what, what we're doing. Okay. Um, my dogs are wrestling or something over there. So hopefully that, you don't hear that too much in the background. Okay. So where did we leave off? Um, I kicked this off, um, but then didn't wait for it to finish. Um, but since the last time I streamed it, we encountered an error. And uh, the way I develop, um, the way I write code, is I expect lots and lots of errors. So I write a function, I write the code, and then I execute it and see what happens, and then fix the errors along the way. Um, versus sitting down and designing it all the way through and using my brain like I probably should, this is what I do. So I encounter lots of errors. Errors are great. And the nice thing is, we, it's usually pretty simple to figure out what the error is. So here, my new function um, failed. And if I look at the exception, the exception is um, this state machine role is not authorized to invoke the function. So that is a pretty obvious problem that, that we should fix. So what this means, so last time uh, I defined my state machine, um, let me say this, two times ago, I built out a state machine only did um, the transcribe process. I had that working. Last session, I added this new Lambda comprehend paragraph. And I added it to the definition correctly. So here is my comprehend uh, paragraph step in, in the state machine. So I'm writing 
I'm defining my state machine in JSON and packaging it into a giant string and YAML cloud formation. It, it, it works. So here I've defined my state of comprehend paragraph. It's a task type with a resource um, that I parse in down here. So the problem is this is getting defined correctly. The problem is the role that the state machine runs in doesn't have access to actually invoke that function. Um, so I am a huge fan of um, not giving, uh, only giving roles and permissions when explicitly needed. So least, you know, least access to all the different AWS environments. Um, so here you can see I clearly have, this is the role for that state machine. I did give it invoke, ac invoke action on the first two functions, but not the third. So what I need to do is I need to get the comprehend paragraph lambda function. The resource name is, I'm copying that. And I just need to add that to uh, my resource for the role. So here what I just did is I added to this array of resources the ability for this role, which gets assumed by state machine, the ability to invoke my new function. So I grabbing the attribute that is ARN, which is kind of like the address, um, and adding it here. So now I should be able to deploy this um, and it should do an update. So again, I'm using the SAM CLI. Um, so here um, I am had to build it. So first step is you need to build the Lambda functions uh, using Docker, and then we upload that and deploy it into AWS. Here I'm only making a change to a role, but I still like to do a build every single time. And so what it's doing is it's uh, starting up the Docker image. It is then taking each of these Lambda functions that I've defined, building them, pulling down the requirements, using pip to determine all my Python requirements needed, packaging it up into a zip file, and then preparing for the deployment up to CloudFormation. Let me take a quick drink. All right, so where are we at? It's still building. Perfect. So again, all I did was make one little change to this resource, but it should allow the state machine to have the proper permissions now. Um, and this is also another way that I program is if I'm not explicitly sure what IAM permissions are needed, I will run it without it and then see what the error is, add that permission, and then keep going like that. Again, I like to be very explicit about what permissions and actions and resources are needed and only allow that instead of just doing star star and giving root access to everything I did. Okay, so it picked up that this has got modified. So do, do I want to deploy these change sets? I do. And so what this is doing, this is updating the CloudFormation stack. And if we go into CloudFormation, we can see that it's updating here, but the CLI will give me the exact same output. So this should run pretty quickly and do an update, because again, I'm not changing that much, just the backing role. There we go, update complete. My dog is really hyper right now. She's pounced on her sister, that's fun. Okay, so now if I go, and if I were to rerun this state machine, um, it should work. Um, but I haven't even gotten to executing this Lambda function, so probably I'm gonna encounter another error. Now here's a, here's a tip that I, I come up with. Uh, this first part here will take 10 to 15, 20 minutes to do the um, transcribe processing. Hold on just a second. Hey, stop it, stop it. Okay, so um, I'm expecting another error in this Lambda function. I don't wanna wait 15 minutes and meet every single time. Um, and so what I can do is this state machine, um, the nice thing is it tells me what was passed to that state machine. And then I can also look at what the output would be. So I can come up as an example, I can come up here and look at the last step and see what was passed in and what was passed out. I can come back to this failed step and say, what was supposed to be passed in was this. 
the reason why this is important is I can copy this JSON and then go to that Lambda function directly and execute it using that payload and simulate the state machine invoking it. Um, this doesn't necessarily uh, f test what I just fixed, which is the state machine being able to invoke this method. So I'm still going to kick off a new execution, but this is going to take about 20 minutes to run. So while that's doing that, I'm going to just test just this Lambda function. So what we do is this is Lambda function. Um, I coded it over here. So this is the um, comprehend paragraph. So this is it. Um, it got deployed um, and packaged up using SAM. So what I can do is I can test this directly. So when I test it for the first time, it says configure a test event. So this is what the event is going to be passed in. Um, so I'm going to call this um, actually state machine input. And I'm just going to paste in here what state machine tried to pass to it. So this is what state machine tried to pass to it. So I'm going to create this test input, and now I can invoke this and see what happens. So I invoked it, and lo and behold, I have a bug. Big, big shop. Um, okay. Um, and actually, the the bug here is, let me actually do it like this. I need to rerun it. Okay, so the bug is that event is not um, defined. And this is my logging statement that I just copied over. And if we were to, if we go look at this code uh, again, what I'm doing here is I'm I'm just borrowing a lot of code from um, the uh, the blog that I'm that I'm following. Um, so I'm just copying and pasting it and running it and hoping that it works. And then I added this logging statement to it, and you can see here this is what it's complaining about on line 33 event. I always. Um, so this event is supposed to be logging what is coming into the Lambda function. My expectation was that the Lambda handler had this, uh, this uh, signature to it, where the first parameter is called event, the second parameter is called context. In this code that I just copied over blindly, they called it mapping, not event. So um, I need to either re rename mapping to be consistent with like my own preferences or rename events. And I think I'm actually going to rename mapping. So let's see where all mapping is being used. Um, interesting thing is this not being used all that much. Um, Interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna actually just change this over to event, and maybe, maybe while we're looking at this, I will go back to. So the blog post I'm looking at, they open source. My dog is nuts. Hey, Evie, calm down, calm down, calm down. Okay, so let me look at the source code again of the blog that I am heavily borrowing from. Okay, so we're on the comprehend paragraph piece. There we go. And they called event. What did I do? I must have uh, done something really bad at some point in time um, where that got renamed. So this definitely should be event. And let me make sure. Yeah, look at that. Okay. Um, cool. Fix that. So um, I could. So okay. So again, um, this is just my own personal preference. I what I was getting ready to do was rebuild this, redeploy this, but I just made one change. I just renamed that that function. Um, the, sorry, the variable, the parameter. So I just did that. I should deploy this from the command line, but I am expecting another bug. So what I'm going to do is I made the change first in my source code um, on my local machine, so I have it. But then I came back into Lambda and just did this. I renamed it here so that I can deploy the changes and test again because, again, I am expecting more bugs. 
this is dangerous because if I don't remember to change both, then I can get out of sync. Um, and my source of truth is always going to be my source code here. Um, so this can get me into trouble and, and definitely does, but I was careful and just renamed it both places. Okay, now we get another bug or an, another issue. So the issue is the transcription URL. Uh, we do not have permission to open that. And this is uh, 403 forbidden on line 214. Where are we at? Uh, wrong line number. Uh, line 54, sorry. That makes more sense. Okay, so here we are trying to open the transcription URL. The URL, if we look at our test event, is an S3 bucket URL. So probably this needs access to, uh, it needs an IAM permission to this. Because I'm guessing that when transcribe finishes, it doesn't just leave it completely wide open. So uh, again, this is totally expected because I don't give permissions to Lambda functions unless I think they're really necessary. And um, the, the blog that I'm borrowing from, the way they did this is they defined all of their functions in CloudFormation using the same um, role in the back end. Uh, so the same permissions for every single Lambda function. I personally don't like to do that. Um, I prefer to give each Lambda function its own specific role and permission so that um, it can only do what I expect it to do. So here, um, Let's take a look at what permissions there are here that I might be missing. Oh, I should also make sure that, uh, verify that this is the proper one. And I think these are the only, this is the only um, role for every single Lambda function. Yeah, so process transcript paragraph Lambda service role. Awesome. So let's find this resource, which is here, and look at what um, they gave it. So they gave it um, S3 access to those buckets. Um, what's interesting is that if I come back over here to my Lambda function, this is not my bucket. So this is a bucket that is um, managed by transcribe. And I'm wondering if this just bucket just expired because this is a bucket from a week ago. So let's see how, uh, okay, so again, if I rerun this process, it's gonna take about 10 minutes. So what I'm wondering it, let's go into Amazon Transcribe and take a look there for just a second. And again, I'm building this as we go. So I, you know, it expires in a long time. Um, you get to watch me just completely fail and have fun with this. So that's the input location. Um, this is the preview of the transcription. So you can see it's pulling in um, for myself and, and Jeff. Where did it put the output? Uh, Or actually, how did I define this as the service managed S3 bucket? Okay, so that's where that goes. I wonder, um, I wonder what permission is needed to get from the service managed S3 bucket. Okay, let's look this up. transcribe service manage s3 bucket
So we are able to choose a bucket, and maybe that's what I just need to do. Let me go back and look at the source code that I'm pulling from. And it creates a transcription job. Oh, there it is. Um, start transcription job. Name, settings. Settings include vocabulary name, speaker labels. Media type, media file URI, select like the input. Uh, and then they are, okay. I'm going to cheat and look at, so I did deploy this podcast. Um, this is still running. So I'm, I'm, I'm stalling to see if the step function will actually finish and then we can use that new event data to try and push in there to see if maybe just the URL expired. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm, I did deploy in another account, this podcast, um, solution as is, and I can look at that. I see that it just failed there. Um, which is kind of good. Let me open just a moment. I'll get back to this screen. Sorry, bear with me for just a second. I'm looking up how this ran last time. Let's see if this even worked. It did work. Okay, so let me look at the... Um, I guess I can show this. So this is my other account where I did deploy the whole podcast um, solution as is from the blog post. Um, and part of this, it should have the state machine. So let me open this in a new tab. So this never actually ran. Um, I thought for sure it did because my Lambda function did get executed. Um, so here's my the same Lambda function. Here. Um, so I pulled open the cloud formation which there is a ton of events. Like way too many. Okay, but it's getting there. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the cloud formation um, that uh, came from a blog post to see how it executed to make sure that I'm getting the correct URL to make sure that I can figure out what problem I'm trying to address with the permissions. So here it is, podcast URL. Um, that's the podcast URL. Uh, what, what? Okay, this is the start of the event. Um, and the URL I'm looking for is event which does get logged, transcription URL. Uh, do, 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 do. Transcription URL. Yeah, AWS transcribe. Okay, okay, so they're able to pull that. So what is my permission? Let me pull this off screen. Okay, so I just verified that I'm not doing anything different than the original authors did. So it's definitely a permission issue. Um, that's interesting. It timed out after three seconds. 
Ah, okay. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so I reran the step function. This time, the issue is it didn't complete in three seconds. So what that means is when you, when you define uh, a lambda function, you define how long it can execute. You're charged by both memory size and how long the function executes kind of sum together. Um, and when I defined all these lambda functions, the default timeout is three seconds, which usually works. And if I bet if I go over to the source code, the sorry, the cloud formation from the podcast URL, I bet you they set a much longer timeout, 150 seconds. Awesome. Um, so there's two factors that I need to go back. Like at some point, I'll go back and um, and take a look at which is memory size and timeout, which is like how how big the function is when it executes, and then how long it can actually execute for. Um, in this case, we definitely need to make an update. So it presumably got past the. So let's look at the actual execution of this. Jump straight to the CloudWatch logs. So the last time this ran, it didn't encounter an S3 permission getting that uh, transaction URL. It actually was able to get that just fine. Um, but what it did is it timed out after three seconds. And so here it's processing each of the paragraphs. So what um, this, this function is rather long and complicated. The original authors did a great job of figuring out how to take the transcribe uh, text and convert it into paragraphs and call comprehend to kind of make sense of it. I didn't step through and try to recreate or uh, update any of that. I just am trying to use it as is. But um, one of the things we need to do is fix the execution timeout. There's a couple different places. I mean, I could go into the Lambda console and make a change there. I don't really like doing that. I did it to rename that one variable, but um, now I'm actually making an infrastructure change. I don't want to get these two things out of sync at all. So what I'm going to do is find my comprehend paragraph I'm glad we don't have a permissions issue. That's kind of why I was stalling. I didn't think we had a permissions issue. Um, so this is my uh, SAM definition of uh, that function. It uses the um, global default of three seconds for a timeout. But I want to actually update that. So if I go to, okay, SAM, I want to find out what it is. And I, th I think it is just timeout like this. But to, to verify it, I want to look up the actual definition. So if I do SAM this, it should get me to the documentation page on that uh, little Googling tip I learned. Is it, this is the specification, the YAML specification for SAM model. And here it does have a timeout property. And the timeout default is three, and it just takes an integer. So this is the proper way of defining this. So let's save this and um, deploy it. The other two, if you remember, the other two functions that I have written so far, one kicks off the transcribe process, so that completes in a, a few milliseconds. The other checks on the status. Both those just are just calling an API and getting a result and then ending. So the default of three seconds works per perfectly fine there. And... I don't want to increase those to 150 seconds because if something happens and those don't complete in a few milliseconds and they get stuck in some sort of loop or get hung, um, I do want it to time out at three seconds. The problem being like if this is a big loop and there's it gets hung many, many, many times in a giant loop for let's say I set the default to 150 or let's say I set the default to five minutes for every single function. That means I am paying for hung processes to to stick around for five minutes, that can get expensive very, very quickly. So setting a really small timeout, uh, setting an appropriate timeout um, is kind of the best course of action here. Okay, so now we're rebuilding these functions. Um, before this deploys, let me just kind of show and verify. So this is... Here, this is the Lambda function that was created. And if I go over to configuration, timeout is three seconds. Um, so by me de deploying this change set, 
it should update. It, what it's going to do is replace this function with the newer configuration. My dog's being suspicious. What do you want? What are you doing? And if I refresh the page once it deploys, then we should see the new 150 second. Update complete. I should like let my dogs run around outside for a while and get off their get off their energy. Sweet. Now it's two minutes and thirty seconds. So this function can now run for that long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm go back to my state machine, take the state input and copy it. And if I come over to my function now and update my test event with the new job details and now go back and test it. Let me refresh it just to be. Now if I test it, this is more what I expect. It should take a few minutes. And it is done. And it looks like it was successful and returned a response. Fantastic. All right, so what it, did, what it did is found all the different paragraphs within the transcription uh, of the Office Hours videos that I fed it. So I, what I've done is I've downloaded one Office Hours, I think it was from October last year, um, and I'm using that to test it. Um, so yes, yeah, looks like the last paragraph here is wrapping up uh, the, the whole show. So this is really cool. Okay, so what is the output of this? The output looks like this. So this output is going to get passed into State Machine, um, and then it can get used in kind of the next step. But what this is also doing is this should be writing to an S3 bucket um, all of this uh, data. And actually, the S3 bucket uh, is here, my unofficial Office Hours bucket, which was created by CloudFormation. Uh, so if I go over here to my CloudFormation stack, and I do a search for S3. You see here's my bucket. And now inside my bucket, um, there we are, uh, the podcast keywords, this should be, um, this should be the output of that function. Should be there. Podcast keywords, here it is. So let's download this and take a look at it. Just throw this. All right. This is really cool. So this is the whole transcription um, in a nice format. And what we're going to do is we're going to Gremlin, Loki, great. Um, so okay. So what what happened in that lambda function? I copied and pasted it. I didn't actually walk through it. So what it's doing is it's taking the output of the transcribe, which is just a raw stream of text and punctuation. It is then breaking that up into paragraphs and using Comprehend to kind of pull out important information. So here um, you can see it's pulling out tags. Uh, apparently in this episode we talked about TikTok a lot. Um, and what it's doing is it's found, this is the start time of this paragraph and this is the end time of that paragraph. This is the text of that paragraph. Um, and then these are the tags. Um, and the who the speaker is. So I didn't give it speaker labels, so it's coming back with like speaker zero and speaker one, I'm assuming would be, would be in here somewhere. Um, but these tags are really helpful, and I think comprehend is, is what is helping pull out these tags. Awesome. Okay, so this is working. And, and then that is what we're going to dump into um, our search database, Elasticsearch. Um, and I think we, we may get to that next time where we're starting to build up the Elasticsearch cluster. Um, and I should say that we're going to use Elasticsearch. Um, it's a full text search engine, which is what we're looking for. I want to be able to search these paragraphs of text and, and use these keywords to pull this out. Um, the only thing I don't like about Elasticsearch is that it's not serverless. So once I create an Elasticsearch instance, it's going to create um, 
I think we'll create a cluster of, of one node and it's going to be running all the time, which is not ideal. I, lo I love using DynamoDB um, wherever I possibly can. Um, I haven't gotten to play with ser serverless uh, Aurora yet, but that looks really, really promising as well. Um, but DynamoDB is a great key value lookup type system um, and not really great at full text. So if I only wanted to search um, the tags, then that could work really, really well to use DynamoDB for that. Um, you could structure it in such a way that you just, it'd be an amazingly lightning fast database to look up tags. Um, these tags don't have everything that I want in there. Um, at least that's my assumption. Uh, I should, I, maybe I could look into how to improve the tags to pull out more information. Like if I do a search for APL, I not even in this one. Um, if I do a search for, uh, like I saw Amazon Pay show up in there. So here, Amazon Pay, but it broke up into two separate tags. This is where if I had a better uh, custom definition, uh, not, not custom, custom vocabulary, that would help. Um, so I could um, add more words into the vocabulary that Comprehend uses. Um, but right now, like, I don't think this is going to give me the type of... Uh, that's funny, U-R-L-S. Um, this isn't going to give me the, the, the searching that I'm looking for. Like, I want to be able to find, um, like, I would want to be able to search for, like, slang words. Tell me in office hours when uh, we were talking about slang words and have that be able to pull up in the search. So I'm getting to, um, I, I'm hesitant to start on Elasticsearch today because it's going to create a cluster and then start running that cluster. Um and I like to keep costs down to minimum. Um, and if you look at our architecture diagram, this is the only um, piece that's going to be uh, like a server running. Everything else is, is serverless. Now, these services uh, here, transcribe, comprehend, media convert, they're not free. Um, they're not, you know, extremely cheap. If you start doing this at huge high volumes, like these would cost a, a good chunk um, to process, you know, hour-long videos. We're doing one hour long video a week, so it's not too bad. Um, the other services like Lambda is going to be extremely cheap. We'll probably stay underneath the free tier for just all of our Lambda execution. Step functions, still going to be pretty darn cheap. It's these three serv these four services here that are going to add up. And I haven't done the math yet to figure out what like a monthly cost for this dip would be. Um, and maybe I'll do that as an exercise. But um, this running all the time is, is not ideal. Um, and maybe I can brainstorm on ways to uh, get around this for a small project. Uh, but for right now, that's what I'm, this is what I'm going to move forward with. Let's see if uh, I get inspired along the way. Um, I, I, I do have a hobby business on the side where I'm running an Elastic cluster, Elasticsearch cluster uh, for like marathon and uh, triathlon results. Um, maybe I could piggyback off of that um, because my traffic is going to be really, really small. Um, but I don't want to get into that yet. I don't want to mix uh, across the streams, so to say. So let's just move forward with this. But um, I'm not done here. So um, here is my state machine. I, ver I got this working now. So we, we fixed all the issues here. If I rerun this 15 minutes later, it would show green, hopefully. But uh, instead of rerunning it now, what I want to do is actually want to add the next um, the next function. So here, um, they actually do two things in parallel because these are not dependent upon each other. Uh, they actually are doing two things in parallel. So the second function um, is very similar to the first function, except they're not breaking it up by paragraph. And if we go down to where they talk about these two functions, um, so this function contains logic that is similar to the first one, but the output is full text transcription in a readable for format. Um, I'm going to include this function um, only because they did, and uh, I feel like it would become necessary. So this is the full text version of that, um, and we're just going to take this and do the same thing. So first step is... Let's go and create the definition for this new function. First, I'm going to create the definition. Then I'm going to create the source code. Then I'm going to add it to the step machine, step function, state machine, state machine, um, and go from there. Okay. 
So instead of comprehend paragraph, we're going to call this comprehend full text. Um, and we're just going to duplicate source code over here. So now I have this method here. We can go and look. Let me actually just duplicate this tab. We can go and look to see what um, what timeout and such they have for this. Uh, so again, they have um, timeout at 150. They do have memory size at 256. Um, I'm going to kind of leave those alone for right now. Um, but I will leave the timeout at 150. So, okay, let's open up this guy. This is the copied one, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just get rid of it. And then I'm going to copy the raw text from our blog authors. Put it here and kind of do the same type of stuff that I did before. So let me open up my previous one. That's finished. So this is on the left here is the paragraph one that we got working on the right here is the full text one that I just copied and pasted over. Um, so what I want to do is update this on the right to match the changes I'd made on the left, if that, if that makes sense. Okay, so first is I'm going to get rid of their logging stuff because I want to do my own logging. Um, I'm surprised at how different this looks. Um, you know, is this even the right function? So this is the full text one. And the reason why I asked that is because it looks like they have Elasticsearch stuff going in here. So I want to make sure that this is the correct one okay so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna look at their cloud from or their state machine definition and say okay here it is um process transcription full text so they're doing that in parallel so this is the right one the next one is upload to Elasticsearch. okay so this is process transcription full text that is where i'm looking at right Process transcription full text. So again, the reason why I am uncertain about this is that they have uh, these Elasticsearch endpoints in there. And it looks like they're just leftover artifacts. Like it's not actually using them. Let's confirm this. Yes, endpoint. Yeah, okay, so let's get rid of this. So I think when they, when they at some point they didn't clean this up. Uh, I am not going to fault them because I, uh, my code is nowhere near perfect. Okay, so region, region. Um, wonder why they're specifying the region. Uh, we don't need to do this. And are they even using the transcribe client? They are not, so let's get rid of that. Um, just like to be consistent with everything. Um, last search connection. So I don't think these are necessary. Okay, that is necessary. I'm just cleaning up. Um, I, if I'm going to steal, I'd like to at least keep it a little bit consistent. Okay. So, process transcript, uh, chunk up transcript. And they've done a like, I, I think the key here is they've done a ton of really hard work uh, to take the incoming transcribed text and get it into a format that actually makes sense. Um, so, kudos to them. I'm just being nitpicky about leftover artifacts that uh, aren't necessary anymore. Okay, so this is my... Um, this is why I like to do, I try to be super consistent about setting the log level. Um, it's just a preference that I like. And I like to set that up at the beginning of the Lambda handler. Okay, event is the right name. Perfect. The other change that I made is that um, I kind of flattened the incoming event. 
So I want to make sure that I, I update this. So the incoming event that comes from state machine um, is a little bit different than theirs. And then let me see if... Okay, so this is... Uh, this is interesting. So they are using the podcast URL, which we don't have a podcast URL. We just are pulling down YouTube videos. Like our use case is slightly different. Um, so where are they using the podcast URL? They are not using the podcast URL. So let's get rid of that. And let me get rid of that. Um, and let's see, what else are they pulling off of the event? We need to make sure. Okay, vocab info. How are they using vocab info? So process transcript, the last parameter is vocabulary info. And they are using vocabulary info. This I skipped over um, on purpose. And I think I want to do the exact same thing. So I'm just going to skip over this mapping. They're doing something, so they've created, they've, they're doing something with the custom vocabulary where they're saving it off into S3 and they're pulling it in and they're using, they're doing something with it. And I want to just ignore all that for right now. And I'll come back in um, and add it in later if it's needed. But for right now, I'm just going to skip over it. Okay, so now they're getting the transcription URL. Um, so vocabulary info is not needed anymore, but I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it. Um, they're doing it in a safe way. Vocabulary info none. Perfect. Um, I'll leave it in there for right now. Not, not disrupt this too much. Okay. The other thing is, um, I need to change all the logging statements. So I prefer to log stuff like this logging. They, they're using a different structure for how they set up the logger. So I'm just going to, um, make those changes um, so instead of I have logging.debug instead of logger.debug um, not a big deal I'm just calling it directly from the library um, so let's just find all the places of logger and replace it with logging And then I'm going to go back and update these even more because I'm not a huge fan of the way that they're logging stuff. Um, okay, so now let's go up and up and change these logging statements. And I'll kind of explain why. So what they're doing is they're um, using JSON dumps um, to create strings. And what this looks like um, is it the um, the CloudWatch log then has like a bunch of like line breaks inside the inside of it. And I, I don't like that. I like to just log just the pure object and then it'll come through as JSON. And then um, I think it's much more readable. Um, and then you can also search your CloudWatch logs um, by just searching through the JSON using like a JSON search string. So my preference is to just do stuff like this. Um, to me, this is a lot cleaner. I, I like this. This is fine. That's really great, helpful information. Um, same here. I'm going to just update this. Get rid of the JSON dumps. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Let's get rid of these. And then this, uh, I prefer just to have just encountered an error. That's fine. We're logging error. So we don't need to say error. We can just log the error. It's my own personal preference. Disagree. If you like, um, okay. So the last thing we got to do is ensure that um, what is so we ensure that what's coming in can be uh, to the lambda function can be worked. Now we have to make sure what comes out of the lambda function um, is good and can be useful to the next uh, method in the chain. 
So here, what I'm returning is this giant thing, and we want to do something very similar. So what does print uh, process transcript return? It is returning just the transcript location. So, and again, that's useful. So what I'm going to do, uh, here it is. We're returning this from the process transcript function. So let's just do this. So now this is um, that bucket and key. And then what I want to do to be consistent with my other methods running in parallel, I'm going to do this. Okay, so here what I'm doing is I'm returning a lot of the stuff that gets passed in. So basically I'm passing through a bunch of variables. So the next function in the state machine has access to all that information. If I were to only return transcribe location, transcript location, then all the other detail would be lost. Um, and only thing coming out to the next function by default would be just that um, transcript location. Now you can do a lot more interesting things with routing of parameters and state machines. Um, it hurts my brain, so I just like to do this. So the These events, the data that got passed to the Lambda function, I'm passing out of the Lambda function. So it, the Lambda function is just basically um, mutating and adding to uh, that bucket of um, return values and passing through, if that makes sense. Um, so here, what I want to do is process transcript uh, returns bucket and key. So here what I'm going to do is transcript location. So bucket. So key. Cool. Now the return value should include what originally was being returned plus everything got passed to it. Okay, that should work flawlessly, I hope. Um, so here again, here is the definition. I am passing in a bucket name as an environment variable, which is being used here. Um, so I don't need to print that. I know what it is. Uh, so now we let's look at the permissions. Um, it is calling see what it's calling and comprehend. Uh, it is calling batch detect entities, which we have that permission accounted for. Um, what else are you calling? Looks like that might be it. And they're doing a lot of hard work to process all that. Okay, so my permissions look like they're set up correctly. Now I need to go and add this to my state machine. So to kind of give a better, I think it makes more sense visually to kind of look at it. Um, this is the state machine. I'm def now I need to update the JSON that um, goes behind this. So last time, so I went in parallel with com comprehend paragraph is this comprehend full text. So in, I already created the parallel path. It just only has one item in it. So now what I'm going to do, that's this. This is the comprehend paragraph. What I want to do is just add another branch to it. Um, and the branch is really only going to have one step, which is um, each branch only has one step. On this branch, comprehend full text is where it starts and where it ends. Um, and this is not the proper ARN. Oh, ah, I forgot to update the resource name. Comprehend full text. That's important. Um, so now, so um, that's my string replacement. The value of that string replacement will come down here. I think there's a better way to do this even, but this is how I know that works. I've been using this pattern for a really long time. I like these string replacements with the ARN. And to fix a mistake that I'm, I made last time, I'm also going to come down here and add it to my role that is being used to execute the state machine so it has permissions to invoke this new Lambda. Okay, 
I made a bunch of changes just there. Let me build and deploy this. So created a new role, created a new function, created uh, or updated the current state machine, updated the current state machine role. Um, there should be a lot going on here. And uh, again, every time I add a function, the build process takes longer because now it has to build yet another dependency, which is this new Lambda function defined in this folder. So the way Sam works, it, it like looks through and finds all the serverless functions, says the code URI, which is like a relative path, is comprehend full text. So it looks in here, it sees the Python code, it looks at the requirements, um, the dependencies, and then does a build in Docker so that it can then compile everything so that not only my code, but all the uh, dependencies compiles that all into a zip file and uploads it to S3. So it has to do that for every single function, which I'm getting more and more functions now. So that's what's taking a little bit longer each time. Now it's uploading, it should be preparing the change set. And it should include at least four changes. Uh, two resources added, state machine resources modified, perfect. Okay, so now if I deploy this, it should update my state machine successfully. Um, this is where I usually get an error saying my state machine JSON syntax is completely invalid. Happens a lot. I'm writing JSON in YAML in a giant string. Um, this is a minor change. I'm hoping I've figured out my brackets correctly. It looks like I did. Oh, it hasn't gotten to the state machine. Um, usually I'm missing a, a, a quote or a comma something stupid. It looks like we might be in luck. Okay, finished the roll. Now it's actually updating the state machine. And that was easy. Sweet. Okay. Now if I come back to my state machine and do a refresh, Um, well, I actually have to go, okay, so let me go to the definition. This is the definition of that execution. Um, so now this is what the definition looks like. Runs these two things in parallel and takes the output and passes it to the next step. The next step is going to be to take the outputs and load it into Elasticsearch. Um, but I don't have a I don't have an Elasticsearch cluster running, so I need to do that. Um, I need to then set up my Elasticsearch uh, indexes, make sure those are getting set up correctly. I want I, um, The way Elasticsearch works, you can start loading data in it, and it'll just m figure out what the mapping is. Um, I think uh, what I'd rather do is set up the mapping myself and then load the data into that. Um, because I very this is going to be a very strict thing that I want to be able to search in a very specific way. Um, and then the other thing is I need to um, figure out, I need to add the media convert step in here. So there's going to be, we're going to start at a different location and do media convert first to convert the raw um, YouTube video into the YouTube format that we want. And then I have to figure out how to trigger all this, grab the, S, grab the YouTube video, pull it down into S3. I still haven't figured that out. Um, I've done it before, but I don't remember how I did it. So I have to refigure that out. Um, but if we re, um, oh, if we re-execute this, so, um, if, if you just say start execution, it gives you like a blank input. Um, if you go back to one of the previous executions and say new execution, it'll use that. And this is, this is the input. This is my bucket. This is my, um, pre-formatted office hours from September. So let me start this execution and it'll pull up the new, even though I started from it, Old execution with the old definition, it'll pull up this definition. So we have to wait 10 minutes for this to kind of go through and do its thing. Um, and I'm actually thinking this might be a really good uh, stopping point for today. 
um, we got a lot comp well we got a lot accomplished we got this function working this function written um, I guess what we could do uh, before we do that so just like I created a test event here for this function what I could do is I could go into the other function the full text function Ooh, it's not gonna let me do that right uh, let's go this way so these get automatically created by uh, the CloudFormation. So here's my full text function. What I could do is I could run this manually just to see what happens. So configure test event. Just see if this is working. Then we can fix any bugs. Um, and let's hit test to see what happens. Oh no. I hate when that happens. Uh, when you move these windows, it like totally resets uh, what was happening. So let me just retest it. Ah, this is why we test it. I'm able to import module app from Common Lib. Common Lib, yes, this has bit me every single time. Um, so they had a common library that they used um, to create a random file. I, yeah, here it is. I should have looked for that. Okay. So they're using ID generator from that. So now we can get rid of that dependency. And they have this new function, find duplicate people, that they wrote in the common lib folder. So their common lib is here. Find duplicate. I'm just going to steal this definition and throw it here. Find duplicate person. Now I can remove this dependency. Um, and that should fix that bug. And if I deploy this fast enough, it might get there before the state machine finishes execution, which would be cool. So it has to go and rebuild every single Lambda function because it doesn't know exactly what changed. Um, so as you see, like this gets longer and longer. When you only have one function, this is a very quick process. Um, as you go, it gets worse. And again, I what I could do, um, just to prove it, I could come over here, copy this whole thing. I haven't changed any requirements or any dependencies. So what I could do is come into my Lambda function and paste it in here and deploy it and then test it. I don't like doing it this way because I get out of sync. Um, and we got a 403 forbidden error. Um, and the Lambda handler. Line 361. Oh, uh, line 69. Yeah, this is really interesting because um, why do I get an error on these? That URL must only work for a short period of time. Let me look up the, um, the definition of these. Documentation page. Okay, so start transcription job. I think I don't want to go to developer guide. I want to go to Okay. Can you start with the API? I wonder if, mm, 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 mm. I'm trying to see if there's a better way of doing that or hmm. API reference. Okay, so start transcription job. I'll 
fucked up fucking name. Actually, no, I want um get transcription job. This is the response. Uh, transcript file URI. Interesting. It doesn't talk about permissions. It doesn't talk about how long that's available for or anything like that. It's just weird to me that that's failing. I may have to go and look at this. Uh, off. Okay, so let me come back here. This failed, but what was the step input? Was that? Let me use this as. Oh, that's going to fail. I meant to configure test event. It's the exact same thing. Um, Interesting. And am I grabbing the URL the same way? So transcript URL, URL open, URL open, yep. Weird. There's something I am missing. And I don't think it's that, um, oops, I just kicked my dog, my other dog. I'm sorry. I mean, I had to look into this. So one of the things, um, one of the things that we're doing is when the transcribe job runs, we're not specifying an output bucket for the output. And so what it's doing is it's using a service manage S3 bucket. What we should probably do is have it dump it into our S3 bucket so that we have better controls over it and we can access, restrict access and so on. And I think we'd get rid of this whole thing. Um, what's interesting to me though is like, it should be available for 85 days. Um, so I'm not sure exactly why we're getting like those exceptions. Okay, but let me go back to my latest running state machine here. It's still in the loop of waiting on the transcription status. What is the last output in progress? Um, so this is job OJ max. It is in process. So we're just waiting on this to finish before calling it a day today, but I may just call it now um, and then figure out how to I think that's what we should do. I think we should update the transcribe start method to write to our output bucket so that we have better access controls over it. And then I can make sure that these two functions have access to go get data from that. Um, so instead of just doing like a URL open, we could do an S3 get on that. Um, and I think this would be much better, uh, much better, cleaner setup. And then we have better access over expiring the contents and, and so on. So I'm going to make note to do that next time. Um, let's see. Making a post-it note. Um, update. Update. Comprehend. And then that should make that go a little bit more smoother. I was hoping this would, come on, it's been 10 minutes. <laughs> I was hoping this would resolve before we, uh, before I got off, but I do need to get off uh, now at this point. Um, so, okay, so let me, I should probably deploy that change set. I manually copy and pasted um, that code over just to show that I could, but now I want to actually use SAM to deploy that so that we stay consistent. Again, I want 
all my infrastructure, all my code, all that to be a source of truth being my GitHub repository and all the code there and CloudFormation templates and, and so on. Um, I will sometimes muck around with the, um, with the going into infrastructure and, and modifying things like modifying Lambda permissions or renaming variables there. But I, I, I don't want to do that very often. I always want to go back to the source of truth and make sure that that's updated. Um, so let's add this in. Okay, commit, added, comprehend, full text, processing. Push that up there. And again, if you follow along, um, I have a pinned repository. So if you go to my user, Ryan J. Lo, um, I have a link in my Twitch stream. Um, you should find this uh, this public repository and where you can follow along. Again, I need to update the readme. Maybe I'll do that um, between next time. This is just the standard um, SAM readme, um, which is useful, but uh, I want to actually update it. And I should like include you know, what I'm doing and the architecture diagram and, and all kinds of good stuff like that so people have some context to what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, so I will uh, keep working on this. Um, hopefully, it worked. It worked. Sweet. Um, I will keep working on this. Uh, we should have now multiple things over here, keywords and transcript. So this should be the full transcript. Sorry, I was saying goodbye, but then I just want to... I'm going to open this either way, so I might as well do it. Do it now. Um, this is the full transcript with a bunch of tags on it. Um, so cool. There's TikTok in there. Yeah, we talked about TikTok in this episode. Um, dates, uh, people. Uh, so there's my co host, co -horse, co host, Jeff. Um, awesome. Super cool. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, cut off the stream now um, and we'll keep working on this. So I should be back on Friday, the exact same time uh, to continue this. Um, and hopefully we can get into Elasticsearch at that point um, and keep working on this. So uh, thanks and uh, I'll see you next time. All right. Bye.